thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's uh, good to have you here. Uh, I would like to to begin by um, thanking uh, all the people who has have made it this possible. Uh, first of all, I would I would like to thank the office of the provost um, for supporting this and making this uh, this possible. Um, it's, it's very important that that the university supports this kind of uh, activities uh, that that are come from the from from the humanities and social sciences, and I hope this this can uh, happen more often. Uh, I would also like to thank um, thank Katie Vernon, the chair of the Hispanic Languages Department, uh, for supporting this, and actually all my colleagues from the from the Hispanic Languages Department. Uh, I would like to thank uh, also Paul Firbus, the director of the uh, Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, uh, the chair of the History Department, uh, Gary Marker. Uh, who's here with us as well, uh, and Paul Gutenberg, uh, professor of the history department, who has been very enthusiastic as well, uh, supporting this, um, and also uh, Sean Chandra, the chair of the sociology department, and especially Tiffany Joseph, who's also here, and has been very enthusiastic about organizing this and, and supporting this. Uh, and I would like also to thank uh, Jordi Broderick, uh, the, admi the um, administ uh, administrative uh, person in the Hispanic Languages Department. He just, he, she has been very, very helpful in organizing, uh, organizing everything, uh, this talk. And especially, I would like to thank uh, Lilia Schwartz, uh, who's here with us today. She, uh, she's a full professor of anthropology. Uh, in uh, Brazil's uh, one of one of Brazil's top universities, the Sao Paulo University, University of Sao Paulo, uh, and she does a really interdisciplinary work. Uh, she, although she is, a, is an anthropologist, she she works. Uh, she has a very strong dialogue with uh, colleagues in in history. She's also a historian. She has she, she has published uh, very important history books. Uh, uh, her main interests are the history of slaves, racial theories, as many of you have been able to, as you, many of you have been able to read her uh, her text, uh, history um, of the Brazilian court, uh, history of 19th century Brazil, uh, academic art, and the history of anthropology in Brazil. She has published several several books. I'm not gonna uh, name them all. Uh, but I'm going to name the two books that have been published so far, tr translated into English. Um, they are The Spectacle of the Races, uh, Scientists, Institutions, and Racial Theories in Brazil at the End of the 19th Century. And uh, the other book is The, Emperor, the Emperor's Beard, uh, Dom Pedro II, A Tropical King. Uh, Professor Schwartz won on three occasions, actually, the the Nijabuti Prize, who's, uh, which is Brazil's most important literary prize, uh, she has also curated many different exhibitions. Uh, she's currently developing an exhibition on Brazilian uh, history th through the present, and she has been a visiting professor at Oxford University in the UK and. Uh, at Leiden University, also at, at Columbia University, and she and since 2011, she is a global professor at Princeton University. So please welcome uh, Lilia Schwartz uh, here with us today. Just uh, a brief comment, uh, a more practical comment now. Um, of course, Professor Schwartz, after after her talk, will be open to uh, uh, questions from the audience. So you're very welcome to go ahead and, and ask her anything that uh, you would like to know more about her talk. Um, and uh, this is for my uh, HOS uh, student, the class. Remember that um, I'm going to be tomorrow. I have I will have office hours tomorrow uh, from 2:30 to 4. You're very welcome to come. 
uh, I cannot answer questions about the midterm now, but uh, you will you will be or you can you're very welcome to write to me as well. Okay. Thank you. Unfortunately, I cannot ask questions about the mid midterm, <laughs> but I'll do my best here. <laughs> and it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here at Stony Brook University. I want to thank the Hispanic department and the, the literature department, it's the same. I want to thank Javier for this invitation. It is that's very good to be here. I lost the first page, so I need the first. <laughs> uh, I also want to, to explain that I decided to select one particular case, uh, the case of the writer, the black writer Lima Bahito. I'm going to use his example, uh, the example of Lima Bahito, as a way to show how in Brazil in the beginning of the republic, re Republican regime, there was a very perverse situation that put together social markers of difference like gender, class, region, and mainly race. Immediately before the end of slavery in Brazil, racial theories became very fashionable, proving that citizenship was not for all. In a country uh, where, at that time, and made in Rio de Janeiro, the former capital of Brazil, 75% of the population were black, Lima Barreto was one of the few intellectuals or even politicians to declare himself as a black writer. On the top of it, he used it to say that his liter literature was a black one and created autobiographical characters that always tried to show and to prove how racist the, the country was. That is why I call this lecture Race and Citizenship in the Turn of the Century. After the equality of the law, after Republican law, scientific racial theories were going to create a second and an inferior citizenship. So let me start. During the time of the Brazilian Empire, a black elite very much connected with the crown enjoyed a re relative preeminence. They were freedmen, liberal workers that, with the beginning of the 20th century, during the Republican regime, su suffered various kinds of so social exclusion, together with a new birth of a, conce of a concept, the concept of race. Several examples others Brazilian intellectuals in considering the limit limitations and the specificities of, mod of modernity in Brazil. But the social experience of this group helps a lot to understand the limits of modernity and to conceptualize uh, freedom and equality in the nation. My interest show, let me put here, let's, yeah. My interest shall be less that in detail revisiting the, of Lima Barreto's biography than to focus in a special moment, Barreto's admission in the psychiatric hospital in 1914 and 1918. This case is particularly interesting in my opinion, considering that Lima Barreto, far from being a victim of his time, was especially in the early moments of the Republic and of his career also, a major, a major protagonist of the Republic. He effectively spoke out regarding various events that marked that period. I'm talking about the vaccine revolt in 1904. In addition to claiming his place as a literary figure, figure against the conservative Brazilian Academy of Letters, he led his own newspaper, the Florial, and also a Bohemian group while publishing articles, chronicas, pamphlets, and short, short stories in the major newspapers in Rio de Janeiro as Malho, as you can see here. Nonetheless, my main goal 
shall not laud his social protagonism as, an is as isolated from the constrictions of his time, nor put aside the suffering that marked his final years. Furthermore, as Max Weber used to mention, the individual is entangled in the web he sh helped to weave. Further, uh, in this vein, Lima Barreto was truly a character of his time. Uh, a time with various forms of controversy, ambiguities, and polemics. polemics. So let me talk about ambiguities. First, it's possible to state that abolition of the slavery in Brazil abolished more than slavery. Abolition was responsible for collapsing a complex system of social mechanisms of uh, difference. Second, critically inquiring about race relations in the context of the First Republic means to understand also the new barriers to mobility due to new scientific discourses of race. That was the moment where phrenology that uh, determinist theories and racial mo models became very strong in the country. Those models created ra racial inequalities and condemned miscegenation, madness, but also tuberculosis, epilepsy, and uh, were signs of his, or even stigmas of physical and mental degeneration. And there was no future to a country like Brazil, a country that was really miscegenated. Equality and freedom during this period are to be understood in different perspective. Uh, as sociologist Antonio Sergio Guimarães noted, if freedom was black, equality was white. In other words, if abolition conceded freedom, equality among humanity was to be reevaluated in that context. Uh, racial criteriums, uh, racial criteria would, would powerfully reemerge at the end of the 19th century and create new forms of social hierarchy and stratifications. Following an era of liberation, the end of the 19th century brought about what became known as the embarrassment of exclusion. That's an expression of Leo Spitzer. And the return in a reformulated biological basis of models, models of ordering. Hannah Arendt referred to liberalism as the theory of the individual. Uh, for her, racial theories were a group model. But even so, if I would take the, uh, Luigi, the anthropologist Luigi Mon opinion, how, what he demonstrates is that raci racism does not represent the opposite side of liberalism. Le to tell you the truth, is like a kind of continuation of this model. Third argument, one cannot forget the widespread fear regarding new forms of slavery and the return of the old ones. There were neither guarantees nor certainties in this environment of ambiguity. This is why the particular social context demanded reaction, protagonism, and, and agency. Some black intellectuals prefer to be described as whites. Others, like Lima Barreto, found agency true color, albeit in a very ambivalent fashion. On the one hand, Lima Barreto highlighted his Afro-Brazilian and slave heritage whenever he had the opportunity, the opportunity. He referred to his house as Quilombo Village and often said he was writing a black germinal, un germinal negro. As a writer, he explored the color of his characters or demonstrated that racism of his society, as in Clara dos Anjos, in, in, which, in which book a young black female protagonist morally, mor morally loses her life and her, her destiny, or in Recordações do Escra Escrivão Isaías Caminha, whose protagonist, Isaías Caminha, re realized he was black on his way to the city. On the other hand, however, whenever he could, Barreto displayed his difference when compared to other black residents of the city, uh, mainly in the outskirts, 
os subúrbios, as we call it. Clara dos Anjos, a kind of alter ego of Lima Barreto, used to say, those strange people of the suburbs. At the same time that Barreto defended the rise of a literature more culturally aligned with everyday life and language, at the same time, he used it to correct the incorrect speech of the people. And he used it to say, contaminate by the terms of the past of slavery. Difference and sameness uh, were part of the, uh, for gay, are part of the, the same mimetic game. He used it to write against soccer, against candomblé, and against capoeira. And at the same time, he used it to denounce the mania of importation, as you, I think you read in the short story, uh, the man who, know, who knew how to speak Javanese. I think you read it, no? <laughs> he failed to enter three times in the Academy of Letters, Brazilian Academy of Letters, and he loved to talk against the same institution. But there were no other time in which the state of ambiguity that I'm trying to describe was really, really strong than during his admission in the National Psychiatric Hospital. This is Clara dos Anjos. This is the hospital. The hospital functions as a group of metaphor, as well as the most difficult reality for the writer who catarchically confessed in his diary that his body betrayed him. Although a strong critic of the scientist's theories of race, Lima Barreto feared that those determinist stigmas then he contested were writing themselves into his personal history. The fear of madness was the central theme in a series of short stories and novels by Barreto, as the very well-known Triste Fim de Policarpo Quaresma. If it's, if to, to, uh, in the other books, he had always, uh, in, uh, he always showed an engaged literature, as Barreto himself used it to define him, his work, he sought to transform all the time the social orders in a kind of national us. Nevertheless, in his chronicas, diaries, and an, an incomplete novel called Cemetery of the Living, writ, written during his stay at the Hospital Nacional, the mirroring process was very clear. He says, the destiny leveled me. I forgot my education. I did not complain. I do not complain. I will not complain. Lima Barreto entered in this hospital in a moment where uh, uh, the, the hospital was becoming to be a very important institution. The asylum quickly uh, became the greatest laboratory for such theories. He used it to divide men and women, adults and children, and also divided social origins. Patients, that, patients were divided by behavior. Passive, passive, agitated, unclean, and those affected for other illness. Lima Barreto entered in the institution in 1914. Already a writer of some fame, he seemed to be in those circumstances like an afflicted patient, subject to the delirium of the alcohol. His personal history seemed to repeat racial theories of the time and the more negative prognosis. He used it to say in his, his diary that one cannot escape one's race and its stigmas. At that time, Enrique Rocho uh, was the f a physician and a director of the hospital, and he, in a disposition in the Second Latin American Medical Congress in 1904, asserted that mulatos, mulatos should be considered uninvolved types. According to him, if everyone carried some sort of hereditary defects, it weighed a lot heavier in the case of mixed racial groups. Rosso also included social history arguments in his disposition, blaming that sudden abolition 
had a great propensity, propension to disorganize the country. I think you know that Brazil was the last country in the Occident to abolish slavery and just in 1888. So it's very difficult to understand why Hoshu is talking about a sudden abolition. Lima Barreto, this is one image of the, the children's, the, the, the children's in the, the hospice. This is a quotation from Lima Barreto in the hospice. I just can't see black. And this is the father. Lima Barreto uh, knew, uh, would be, uh, knew madness through his own family. João Henrique, would be, that was the first unemployed monarchical servant, a former typographist, was sent to work in the colonies of the alienated in Ilha do Governador, Governor Island. In 1902, the fa Lima Barreto's father, João Henrique, became mad. And that was the moment when Lima Barreto had to to give up with his education, his formation, and then went to work as a public employee. It was at that moment, exactly at that moment, that he started drinking. As we saw, Barreto was first admitted in 1914. That same year, in the same book of registration, one can find other patients each having to bear their personal dramas described in brief reports that mentions altercations, religious and political manias, aggressiveness, criminality, religious fanaties, alcohol, alcoholism, jealousy, and other various experiences. That's the umbrella, the big umbrella of madness. The file brings forth a recurring universe. The vast majority of the internees are Brazilians. Their complexion, physical threats, and hair reveals that overwhelming portions of cases of madness were found among dark and poor people. From the observation files emerged the diffic difficult and certainly hierarchized dialogue between patient and medical professional. Although the diagnosis tended to be varied, alcoholism, epi epilepsy, uh, psychosis, epi episodic delirium, senile, de senile dimension, the treatment tended to re repeat itself between purgatives, opium, and tranquilizing tonics. Lima Barreto wished to be classified as a writer, but instead, or at least, was listed as a public employee. It was a profession that he so often mocked and considered much less relevant than his commitment to literature. Barreto, this is the anamnese, as we call it. Barreto, always mirroring himself with his favorite writer, Fyodor Dostoevsky, notes in his diaries the humiliation, humiliation he felt in losing his identity and seeing himself transformed into a mulatto, into one of those that so often manifested the weakness of mestizo madness. In his diary, he wrote, and I quote, the mental capacity of blacks is always discussed a priori. That of the uh, white is a posteriori. Science is a Greek prejudice. Time to enter in this dia dialogical dialogue, and I'm using Bakhtin with this idea of, of having a dialogical dialogue. Uh, this entry in 1940, August, 8, August 18, 1914, certainly stand out for the amalgam of the unknown and forgotten names, the writer Afonso Henrique de Lima Barreto. Sporting the typical jumpsuit with a stamped pandemonio, I cannot, I don't know if you can read, it's that you know, pandemonio, uh, he really, foc he, the young man focuses on the camera. Pandemonio is the translation of the English pandemonium, the etymology of which stems from the Greek radical pan, meaning all, attached to the Greek translation of demon, diamond. The neologism was created by Milton 
in his masterpiece Paradise Lost in order to designate the Saturn's palace. It's also it also designates the Inferno's imaginary capital. What matters here, though, is that the image of Pandemonium is central to Lima Barreto's experience, especially in the case of his novel, The Cemetery of the Living, in which Barreto had drawn a similar portrait of the hospital, either an inferno or a cemetery. In his records, aside from his profession and physical appearance, what is most strange is his racial categorization. Contrary to the picture and his personal history, Lima Barreto is listed, as you can see, as white. It's complicated to discern to whom we can attribute the classification, to the recorder, who was perhaps zealous about whitening a public servant, or to Barreto, who always underlined blackness in his work. The, uh, the, 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 the person that was writing the Anamnese wrote, the observant is an individual with strong complexion presenting stigmas of physical degeneration. What immediately stands out are two powerful words, stigmas of degeneration. Stigma originates from the terminology of the criminal anthropology for First, of the criminal anthropology first articulated by Cesare Lombroso, who studied the supposed parallels between mixed race, criminality, and madness. Stigma does suppose the pres pres presence of essential traits tied of two races. Furthermore, it also assumes that heredity is the determining factor behind behavior. The procedures follow the hospital protocol. Rocho, the director of the observation pavilion, de developed a new technique for the examination of the subtext, 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 subtext of alienation. The recorder would take note of the patient's physical data, define the patient's physiognomy, and finally, his general physics state. The next step was more objective and focused on anthropometric information. School, face, ears, nose, as you saw before. Then finally came a stage considered to be more subjective. That is, the patient's living conditions. In this case, Horshu argued that it was necessary to gain the patient's trust so as to let him speak, they shall falar. Emotional and intellectual tendencies are, uh, of the internist uh, were also noted. A nexus was duly a sign of madness. Excessive religiosity was immediately diagnosed as fanatism. Just excessive in political interest, as especially towards anarchism, were also considered a stigma of the generation. Labeled as loco morais, moral insane, anarchists were condemned for their ideas and stigmatized as mentally ill. One can therefore imagine Limas Barreto's fear as well as his insistence on silencing his anarchist sympathies, considered a sign of intellectual degeneration. The case of alcoholism, alcoholism as the case of Lima Barreto, were those whose, uh, that remain less time in the hospital. Pinheiro, one of the hospital scriveners, wrote about Lima Barreto, all bodily systems seem normal. The only issue worthy of note is that the genital urinary local shows gonorrhea. This venereal disease represented a new symptom of their generation since it implied excess, lack of control, and perversion. Lima Barreto was interviewed again in August, when he should have been less influenced by the effects of the alcohol, and therefore more capable of speaking. So much so that, under family information, Barreto informs that his mother died of tuberculosis. Later, 
did ba only later did Barreto reveal that his father suf suffered from supposed neurasthenia. This concept was introduced by Miller Bird and referred to a state of nervous exhaustion. Lima Barreto decided not to mention his father's illness, only to reveal it later on. Uh, he says, I confess my father has neurasthenia. I truly believe he, he had knowledge about those theories, of the, those heredity theories, and fears that his father's disease would become a stigma and to determine his own weakness. The hospital scrivener noted that Barretus uh, knew a lot of things he, he wrote. Barreto knows see, names of cities, ancient facts, middle history, modern contemporary history. He also knows, writes the Scribner, algebra, geometry, geography. So one can easily suppose the shock the Scribner felt by the hospital, by, uh, knowing of Barreto's erudition. Barreto also mentioned some writers, some favorite writers he mentioned, Bossuet, Chateaubriand, uh, Balzac, Ten, <laughs> And the scrivener also notes that the internee has knowledge of French and English. In sum, says, wrote the scrivener, in sum, this is an individual that has some knowledge and intel intelligence considering where he lives. Along with the compliment comes the customary prejudice comment. From then on, Barreto, Barreto emerged from the files and appears slightly delirious, intervening work problems with fears regarding his anarchist fame. It's in this manner that Barreto's testimony drowns to a close, with notes, with the record notes. The patient seems to be generally calm. The patient says that he worked two books, the patron and the memoirs of a Scribner's Isaias Caminha. The conclusion regarding his illness and his treatment was nonetheless clear. Alcoholism to be cured with purgatives and opiums. This episode helped us to understand Barreto's positions more delineated in his fiction work, The Cemetery of the Living, and hidden in his character, the, the fiction character, Vicente Mascarenhas. There is a chapter when Vicente Mascarenhas says, the doctors, I do not know how and when, have inquired an obsession for generalizations. They suspect any foreigner with a strange name. They suspect every citizen of color Every citizen of color must be called malandro. That's very difficult to translate. No, <laughs> you have to help me here. Scroll down, I don't know. Um, in the novel, Barreto suggests was like living, the, that he was living the spectacle of ma madness, communing within nonsense of the mad, and recognizing that in the hospital, I quote, always black. As Barreto himself concludes, those were my sad partners in isolation and social segregation. Truly, liberty had nothing to do with equality. Lima Barreto was released from the hospital on October, but the vicious circles of alcohol, deliriums and turbulations and admission would not end there. On December of the same year, he was brought back to the hospital. Yet another period of hospitalization took place between December 19 and February 1020. These two episodes, both occur occurring during the Christmas season, marks a second moment in Barreto's lives. In the second moment emerged quite a different Barreto from the man of 1914. You can see the portrait. Filled with resignation or perhaps attempting to remain anonymous this time, as he confessed in the questionnaire of the hospital, Barreto is another man in the file. This time, the hospital recorder classifies Barreto as pardo. I don't know if you could see here. 
brown or mixed race. If we have time, we can talk about this term. Pardo is a kind of none of the others, the otherness of the otherness, you know? but not white. You know? The divergence from the first classification suggests the difficulties the institution faced regarding racial ambiguity. It's quite possible that in this quite Brazilian form of racism, in which one can be whitened or dikened, depending on the social situation, Barreto became evidently black or pardo. His body language this time is troubled and depressed. His head fell into the side, and a much less resistant facial expression is very clear to note. He appears to be as his body uh, betrayed him, his profound convictions. And if the, in his, his body was trying to recover the social determinist theories. After all, in his diary, he always demonstrates how critical he was against this kind of science, stating that science was merely a perspective on things. But this time, the situation was difficult. Different. The inspector of the section came with external information about the father. And then the scrivener wrote, Barreto's father is currently in an advanced state of dementia. Even the scrivener, but even so, the scrivener could recognize the writer. He wrote, the observer enjoys literature and the, re the reputation of a talented and powerful writer. It seems that the observer in his talks in cafes, as you saw the cafe, is very well known and has some kind of uh, popularity. Now, uh, Barreto stayed in the hospital the second time for more than two months. Now, out of the hospital and dealing with the safe terrain of the fiction in his novel, he voices through his characters the reflection he silenced during uh, the, the time he was in the hospital. He, he criticized the policy. He also refutes the authority and pride of the doc doctors. He says, he writes that performs their practice in the vague and nebulous heaven of human madness. In the closing pages of Cemetery dos Vivos, Cemetery of the Living, as in a crescendo, he refers to the unsane and to himself as the refuse of society and asks himself with a pinch of irony, is the constitution, constitution really for you people? It's evidently impossible to forget that at that time, Nina Rodriguez, a famous physician from the tropical school of Bahia, was talking about and giving a lot of lectures in Brazil and outside Brazil about the deterministic theories in Brazil. In his book, he published this book, The Panel Responsibility, in 1888. Eight, the same year of the abolition, and he proposed to have two panel codes, one, two constitutions, one for the blacks, another one for the whites. That's why it's so easy to see how you can travel between the novel, the fiction, and the non-fiction, with Bar Barreto saying in the fiction, the agent and, that he was the indigent ill and social parent. And he says, he writes, I have fallen from dream to dream. Lima Barreto would eventually succumb to a cardi card cardiac uh, arrest in 1922, shortly after he wrote those drafts and his upcoming book. He escaped from the hospital to retire himself in his home, in his library. Cemetery dos Vivos, dos Vivos Cemetery of the Living would remain without an official close. Distinct from the other books, which despite also being biographical, place all meaning upon a fictional character and carried an objective project of social denunciation. In this case, mimesis is at the heart of the cemetery of the living. Sometimes he confu I wrote the original of this document, and sometimes he, confu he 
instead of writing Vicente Mascarenhas, he writes his name, Lima Barreto. In an art, it's not coincidence, and in 1920, he published an article called The Contact. Barreto tried once more to separate himself from his work, stating that he only admitted himself in the hospital because he wanted to observe better the situation in the hospital. It was a final strategy at that moment. He had already come to occupy an unclassifiable space. As Michael Tosi said, mimesis is the space on neither be I, neither be the other. He was trying to write an, et an ethnography of himself. It was no it was not Lima Barreto's wish to publish the content of his diaries, of his draft novel, but these two works of personal memory confirm our impression of his final days. Memory here comes to represent a sort of seal of his afflicted ego, a, a complicated negotiation between poverty, race, and madness in this case. In his chronic that he called da minha cela, from my seal. He recalls with a combination of irony and suffering his measurations. He wrote, I was subjected to anthropometric mensurations which resulted in one small displeasure. I'm brachiocephalic. This term refers to individuals whose cues have a flat posterior face. This was a condition frequently associated with inferior bi biological types. It's clear that, that he has a humoristic purpose, but we know, however, that the effectiveness of a joke resides in the combination of illusions that it present or hides. Barreto contested yet feared and dialogued di dialogically with the categor categorizations he suffered. That was a very dangerous mimesis and show us how social marks of difference can be used in a very positive way and in a very discrimi discriminatory form. Barreto in the sense was far from the concept of belonging and was lost in this perverse game of citizenship and rights of inclusion and social exclusion. Thank you very much.